podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Chris Stemp here, and thanks so much for joining us. This week on the show, we are discussing the most important year of a child's life. Well, at least that's kind of what the book title insinuates. And although that might not be the exact case here, what we're talking about really does need to be addressed, and I'm so glad we're bringing it to the forefront. New research has proven that early childhood education is crucial for all children to gain the academic and emotional skills they need to succeed later in life. And now, we say new because, yes, we all know that getting an education early is a big deal. But what we're now starting to learn is that this type of structured education needs to start early, as early as three years old. And so that's why our guest this week, Suzanne Buffard, is saying the most important year is pre-kindergarten. We also have learned that children who attend quality pre-K programs have a host of positive outcomes, including better language, literacy, problem solving, and math skills down the line. And they have a leg up on what appears to be the most essential skill to develop at age four, strong self-control. And even more so, the reason that it's the most important is because good, accessible pre-K is not that easy to find. I live just outside a major metropolitan city and they still haven't moved to all-day kindergarten. So how are we expecting to have universal, all-day, properly structured pre-kindergarten? Well, that's the issue on the table, and I think there's a lot to learn here. So as I mentioned, our guest this week is Suzanne Buffard. She is a writer with a background in child development and education. She received her PhD in developmental psychology from Duke and has spent the past decade conducting and writing about education research at Harvard. Her newest book is called The Most Important Year, Pre-Kindergarten and the Future of Our Children. I'm going to make this short and sweet because I really enjoy this topic, especially having a little young one at home that we're thinking about pre-K for. So can't wait to send this on out to you all. Head on over to smartpeoplepodcast.com and check us out. Or if you are so inclined, we would love to hear from you. Leave us a review on iTunes. Thank you for listening. And here it is as we talk to Suzanne Buffard on the most important year, pre-kindergarten and the future of our children. Enjoy. So I'm really, look, you know, I mentioned this to you before we hit the record button, but this is a loaded, this is going to be a loaded interview. I have, as my listeners know, you know, two and a half year old. Uh, My wife is a kindergarten teacher. Early childhood education is something that it's a topic of daily discussion in our household. And so I'm really excited to have you on and learn the do's and don'ts and what's going on in the world. That's great. I love to talk to people who are in it and who have questions and thoughts about it. I'd like to learn a little bit more about your background because I think it's, you know, for somebody to focus on kind of those those early years, it's a noble cause, in, in my opinion, and we need that research. And I'm wondering what drew you to that field and kind of how you came up through it, if you remember when the idea kind of started in your brain? I've always been really interested in psychology and in how people develop over time. And as I started working in psychology, I realized that it's really important to have an understanding of where people come from and how their earliest influences shape them as they get older. So when I went to graduate school, School, I pursued a PhD in developmental psychology. And at that time, I was focused on development really across childhood and adolescence. And I was fascinated by a lot of different ages. But when I started working at Harvard and doing research, I was doing a lot of work on two strands of research. 
One was on children's social and emotional development, and one was on relationships between families and schools and how that can promote children's learning. And there was constantly this theme coming up that the early years are really important and have a really big influence on the later years. And I started to see how if you get kids off on the right foot in the earliest years, it makes things smoother for them. And it also makes things easier for schools and policy later on because you don't have to remediate the problems that would be caused if you didn't have the right supports for young kids. So I spent about 10 years doing research, helping develop some intervention programs. And those programs were kind of across ages. But I was really fascinated by early childhood. And I knew that there was a gap between between the research that we have on what's best for young kids and what's actually happening in educational settings for young kids. And then I had my own children. Mm. And I always say that being a developmental psychologist with kids is a blessing and a curse because on the one hand, you have access to so much information that's really helpful. On the other hand, you can make yourself a little crazy in the day to day, like you said in the intro, you know, wondering, am I doing it wrong? Am I messing up my child? But when I started to visit preschool classrooms to choose one for my eldest child, that's when this gap between best practice and real world practice became very stark to me. And I was surprised to discover that even within the same city and even within the same school district, the classrooms varied a lot from one place to another. And I realized that Educators were lacking consistent information about what's best for young kids, and so were parents. Parents were really overwhelmed and confused. Some of them had a ton of questions. Some of them just didn't even know what to ask. And some of the people I talked to were making choices about the right settings for their kids based on things that were easy to see but weren't necessarily things that matter for kids. Like they would get drawn in by a really beautiful early childhood center that actually didn't have very good teachers. Or they would think it was a good sign when they went into a classroom and the four-year-olds were all sitting silently and whispering their answers to the teacher, when in reality, it's better for kids if their classroom has activity and kids are encouraged to talk and that they actually make some level of noise. So that was when I realized that I wanted to try to share some of the information that I had from my professional life with other parents, voters, citizens, policymakers, to help them understand what good early childhood practices look like and why it's so important to invest in them, not just for parents, but for all of us. Because as I said before, those early years are such a solid foundation that they influence everything, including whether kids are going to go on to develop mental health problems and need social services and these kinds of things that affect all of us, even if we don't have children. As you were going through that, I, I put myself in the shoes of these preschool teachers because my wife talks about this. And I can imagine you walk into the room and you're like, yeah, we're just looking at preschools. Oh, I'm just a you know developmental psychologist specializing in early childhood development at Harvard. So no pressure. You know what I mean? Like those teachers must have, and I say this with all the love in the world, they must have hated you. <laughs> you know, I didn't really, I didn't really point it out. I wanted to make sure that they didn't feel intimidated. And I wanted to make sure also that I was getting the experience that any other parent mm. would be getting. So I didn't make a thing of it. And I also consciously chose not to study or write about my children's district for the book. Oh, that's good. That's good. Well, you know, as you were talking about it, the thing that strikes me is you were saying how you realized the impact of the child's early years on future development. And I would say to most people, that seems like something we've known. I, I mean, that's why parents are so anxious these days about how to raise their kids, how to raise them right, how to not screw them up, where to go to school, because it's been drilled into us that, hey, these these years really matter, these first couple of years. So what is it about kind of maybe new research or things you uncovered that were different from just those general warnings of don't screw your kids up early? That's a really good point. 
And I think it's important to note that because of this attention about the importance of early childhood, in some ways we've put too much pressure on young children and on the settings for young children. And so when I visited classrooms, I saw some classrooms that were really not appropriate for young children and that were more appropriate for a second grader, where kids were being given flashcards, they were given tests to see how many vocabulary words they knew, or sometimes they were being expected to sit still on the rug for 40 minutes, which most three and four-year-olds really can't do when it's pretty much act asking them to act out. So I think that what we have learned from research over the last decade or so is not just that the early years matter, but what kinds of things matter and what kinds of strategies really work best for young kids. So one example is that advances in neuroscience have allowed us to learn a lot about young children's brain development. And we've learned that early childhood is a critical time for developing a set of skills that researchers call executive functioning. And those are the skills that allow people to plan and be organized and achieve their goals. And it's everything from being able to listen and pay attention to being able to follow instructions to being able to stay calm in a stressful situation or when you're frustrated and act accordingly. So we're learning that young kids, their brains can go through a huge amount of development in those particular skills, especially if you help build the skills in certain ways. So teachers can facilitate that by having songs, having routines, having games that encourage kids to develop those skills. And that's sort of a new finding. We're realizing that some of the games that we all played as kids, like Red Light, Green Light, and Telephone, and Mother May I, those things are actually really good for kids' brain development. And so good pre-K programs are incorporating those kinds of things into the way that they work with children. And what I wanted to do here was to raise attention to the fact that those kinds of things are really interesting and important for young kids. And they're where we should be focusing instead of drilling kids on vocabulary words. The thing that strikes me constantly is this continual push to get better, use the science, optimize the brain, you know, all this. Because like my wife and I argue about that, not argue, but we discuss this, which is you know, she she, of course, wants our son to have the best opportunities and all that. And I say, look, I went to my neighbor's house half the time for, quote unquote, pre-K, you know, a, a couple of kids there and a, and a woman that helped out. And then I didn't have a formal pre-K and I, I turned out just fine. Right. So what I wonder is. And, and maybe fine is is subjective. Maybe I'm really not that fine, but who knows? But what I wonder is. <laughs> Like, when does it stop or when can we just kind of say, look, do the best you can do, you know, like read to your kid, be around them, love them and they'll be fine. I think that the key is that we want young children to have positive learning experiences wherever, wherever they are, whether they're at home or they're in a school program or they're at a neighbor's house. And that includes things like reading and also finding learning opportunities in daily life, like counting the number of stairs that you walked up when you got home or pointing out the letters on a stop sign and how they spell the word stop. And those kinds of everyday learning experiences are what make learning exciting and interesting for kids. Now, there's no one place that's better for kids to get that, but many children are by necessity in organized care settings because all available parents are working. And we need to make sure that those settings are providing these kinds of positive and exciting learning learning experiences for children. I do think that that message has sometimes caused parents to go overboard and think, I need my three-year-old to be in Mandarin class and music class and in the best Montessori pre-K program and all of these pieces. And I get this question a lot from parents to say, well, do I have to do all of it? And what are the things that are most important? And my answer is always that you don't need to do it all. You, you should try to do some of it. Do what makes sense for your family and for your child. 
the main thing is that we want to be giving kids experiences that get them excited about learning and that get them in the habit of learning. So it's not that they need a whole bunch of structured lessons in all different kinds of things. It's that you want them to be curious about the world around them and to notice letters and to understand numbers so that when they're in their own free time or they're riding with you on the city bus, they notice those things and they learn on their own. That that was really clear. And I, I loved how you explained that, because essentially, as I'm taking it, it's not necessarily about the place or the fanciest thing or all these accreditations or putting them in every class possible. It's just the environment. And if the person taking care of the child or raising the child or educating the child is equipped with enough skills to make it a conducive environment to learning. That's exactly right. And people are often surprised when I tell them that my children have gone to a preschool that doesn't have any windows. <laughs> oh, <And> God. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily have chosen a place that doesn't have windows, but it's a place where the teachers are amazing with kids and they have a great playground and they're really committed to always getting the kids outside. And the kids have a special room where they can go to do yoga and they can go to do movement. And um, so it's been a lesson for me in realizing the things that really matter. And if I were to design the perfect preschool from scratch, it would have lots of natural light. But Every parent has to find the best thing that you can for your child and your family. And if we get so caught up in checking off all the boxes, then you lose the sense of what actually really matters for young children. Mm. Now, I'm wondering why you chose or identified pre-K. Why not three years old or, or two years old or five or six, you know, kindergarten first? What was it about kind of this definition of pre-kindergarten, I guess maybe three or four? Yes. So pre-K is anywhere between three and five years old. Okay. For some kids, it starts when they're four. For some kids, it starts when they're three. And some people call it preschool. Some people call it pre-K. It goes by a bunch of different names. But a main reason that I wanted to focus on this age and I wanted to write the book about pre-K is that for the last several years, we've been in this policy window where voters and policymakers have been really invested in pre-K and, and funding a lot more pre-K programs. We're seeing a huge growth in the number of publicly funded programs in cities and states. And as I watched some of these programs scale up really quickly, I was really excited and encouraged, but also concerned that we were scaling up so fast that it wouldn't provide the opportunity to do it right and to do it with quality. And, um, I wanted to kind of take advantage of this policy window and this time to say, okay, let's slow down. Let's see what we're actually doing and what we should be doing and if we're meeting those goals. Education is still rapidly changing. I mean, it, if you go back, it's not even that long ago. I'd say I think it was early kind of 1900s when really public, free public education for most became even available or accessible. And I saw a statistic that said, uh, 1940, 50% of people had high school educations. So really not that long ago. And I feel like this is just the next evolution because even where I live now, and it's a, a fantastic County with plenty of resources, they don't even mandate a full day kindergarten. So, I mean, like you were saying, this scaling up if we don't even necessarily have kindergarten and access to that, um, expecting pre-K to happen and then get it right seems like a daunting task. There is a real lack of equity in pre-K and, as you said, even in kindergarten programs, both in terms of access and quality. And for a variety of reasons, pre-K programs, privately funded pre-K programs that families pay tuition to have become more and more commonplace over the last couple of decades. And that has really risked leaving behind a group of children whose families can't afford to pay tuition. We have, since the 1960s, had some federally funded programs for children from very low-income families, like Head Start, which is the one that most people have probably heard of. But there's a group of families that make too much money to qualify for Head Start, but not enough money to include a pre-K or daycare payment into their monthly bills. So 
One of the issues is really around equity, that we want all kids to be able to get off on the right foot and to start school as evenly and equally as possible. And if we don't ensure that there's access for kids who can't afford to pay for it privately, then we actually exacerbate the gaps in opportunities and resources that are present from birth. And now a quick word from this week's sponsor. Support for today's show comes from Audible. Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from the leading publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, and business information providers. Unlike a streaming or rental service, with Audible, you own your books so you can access them anytime, anywhere, and from almost any device, including your iPhone, iPad, Android, Amazon Fire tablets, or Windows Phone. Plus, thanks to the Great Listen Guarantee, If you don't like your title, you can swap it for a new one. Not to mention, Audible Channels gives you a collection of exclusive originals, short stories, and comedy, so you always have something new to listen to. Right now, I'm listening to Katie Turr's new book, Unbelievable, My Front Row Seat to the Craziest Campaign in American History, and it is absolutely phenomenal. I take the metro into D.C. My commute's about 45 minutes door to door, and there is nothing better than listening to a book while riding the metro. It is absolutely the greatest thing to do while commuting. All right, so listen up. Get a free audiobook with a 30-day trial at www.audible.com slash smart. That's www.audible.com slash smart. S-M-A-R-T. That's smart. Again, one more time, that's www.audible.com slash smart for a free audiobook with your 30-day trial. And now back to the episode. That kind of brings me to this idea of costs, right? So how do we, as as a nation, add this as a public service when, you know, many people are constantly asking for lower taxes? People, nobody wants to pay higher taxes, right? Nobody. But everybody wants these public services, or most people want them. How do what do we do there? Well, there are some studies that suggest that there's a return on investment if you fund early childhood programs. The studies suggest that for every dollar invested, you save anywhere between three and ten dollars in the long term. Not only because students do better in elementary school, they they achieve higher, they're less likely to be in special education, less likely to be retained in grade, all of those kinds of services that are really expensive. But there's also evidence that when kids went to high quality pre-K, they're more likely to graduate from high school, to have good jobs, less likely to be on public assistance. So there's some evidence that we can actually save money in the long run by investing in the early years. There are other ways in which we can save money with early childhood programs as well. One of them is in parents' ability to participate in the workforce. There was just a report that came out that found that 2 million parents around the country have had to make career sacrifices that they didn't want to make because they couldn't afford the cost of childcare. And when New York City scaled up their big universal pre-K program, they found that about 11% of parents were saying they were actually able to enter the workforce because they had this free option for their children to go to school. So that's an economic piece as well. Both of those are very logical responses to this and things that I think are what prompted kindergarten, because kindergarten wasn't always an option as it as it isn't now. And we're starting to realize the impact it has. And what blows my mind is even now, right, kindergarten ends at, say, 230. Well, who works a full time job and gets off at 230? So it's still not meeting this kind of public need. And so I wonder, have you uncovered or figured out or seen actually any of any good models for how we can balance costs, um, what's needed by the student and also support families who have two working parents or perhaps single parents? It's a really important issue that a traditional school day doesn't cover a parent's entire work day. And that's one of the issues with pre-K programs that are in public schools. Very often public schools have after-school programs, but typically families have to pay out of pocket for those. And this is one of the reasons that community-based preschools can offer unique assets to families. They often provide an eight or 10 hour day 
for example, at a place like the Boys and Girls Club or the YMCA or at a for-profit child care center or a private preschool. And so this is one of the reasons that it's helpful that we have a diversity of pre-K programs and that families can choose different options for their kids. One of the things that I learned while writing the book is that the growth of public pre-K, particularly particularly in schools, has really been a boon for families, but it is threatening the infrastructure of childcare in the community. Because in early childcare settings, the younger children, the infants and toddlers, are more expensive to care for because you have to have fewer adults per children. Mm -hmm. And as kids get older, they don't need as many adults. So the four-year-olds essentially subsidize the younger kids. And as you take the four-year-olds out of private centers and send them to public school, it's creating a real financial hardship on child care centers. So it's something that we need to address in a systemic way to look at early childhood in general and say, what, what is our system going to look like? And one of the interesting ways I have seen communities do this is an example in Boston, where about half of the city's four-year-olds are served in public school pre-K classrooms. And many families are looking for spots but don't get in through the lottery. And so what the public schools have started doing is partnering with the community-based centers to implement the same model, the same high-quality model that's been been effective by research in these other community locations so that that helps the centers and it gives more access to families. And as I write about in the book, it's a, it's a difficult transition in part because there are some real differences in teaching quality and organizational culture between the public schools and a place like the Boys and Girls Club. But Boston is working really hard to try to figure that out and make a way for it to work for everyone. Hmm. So, so Boston... I also could, remember... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I remember the third piece about the cost savings. Oh, good. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> Another thing I found really surprising in writing the book was learning that early childhood teachers in this country are paid so little that half of them are eligible for public assistance programs like Medicaid and food stamps. And we are spending $2 billion as a country on those kinds of social services for early childhood teachers. And we could be investing that money on the front end instead of on the back end, which would make education better for children and make it a, a, a real possible career option for people who want to work in early childhood education, but don't want to be living with a poverty wage. And therein lies the rub, right? The, the pay to early childhood educators. It's one of those things I feel like no one would tell you, oh, I think these you know young educators or, or even teachers need to make less. Like no one would say that. But again, the resources aren't always there. And so I think what a lot of what you're talking about is based on this idea that the costs down the line are the things we need to keep in mind when we're allocating funds and resources early on. And it reminds me of an interview we did recently with somebody who talked about our inability as humans to look at long-term impacts as opposed to short-term. And that's just how we've evolved. And it's the crux of a lot of our problems. And it seems like an education is one of the main areas that's showing up. That's right. I think that's a real issue. And I think another related issue is a tendency to not look at the common good and instead look at the impact only on one's individual family. Mm -hmm. I was reading this morning a variety of tweets after Democrats introduced their proposed child care legislation yesterday. And they're all over the map. But I was really struck by many comments from commenters who said, I pay for my own children. If you can't afford to care for your children, you shouldn't have had them. And I think there is an assumption and a belief that when we talk about funding education in a universal or even a targeted way for people who need the funding, there is an assumption of who those families are that need support and need help. And we think of them as the other. They're different from us, especially if you are fortunate enough to live in a family and maybe live in a place where the cost of living allows you to pay for your own childcare expenses. But 
in my travels, both personally and professionally, I have learned that childcare costs and early education creates a lot of stress and a real squeeze for middle class families. I've met families who were not able to afford to save to buy a house because they were spending money on childcare, or that they were choosing not to send their child to an early education program because they simply couldn't afford it. And so I think there is there is also this this tension of ourselves versus our community as a whole and our nation as a whole and what's what's going to benefit all of us in the long run. What are your thoughts on DeVos and this idea of vouchers and private versus public? Given all your research and your education on this, what are your thoughts on how we should move forward with this debate? Well, so far, we haven't heard very much from this administration about early education and whether and how they intend to fund it. I think it's logical to assume that if they do make any moves in early education, it would be in the voucher space, as you said, because they have talked about that a lot for K-12 education. And there are some existing voucher programs for early childhood education. For example, states often provide vouchers to low-income families to help them pay for child care. And in some cases... There are pre-K scholarships, I think they might call them, in the state of Minnesota. And vouchers have done positive things in terms of increasing access. And that's a great thing. But my concern is that they don't do enough to ensure quality. And that's because of two main reasons. One is that if you rely on a market-driven approach to quality, you create a system where the emphasis is really on the bottom line and not on what's best for children, particularly in a for-profit child care setting. And that's not to say that there aren't some great for-profit early education centers, but I want to make sure as a researcher and as a parent that the focus in those places is really on doing what's best for kids, not on what's best for shareholders or corporate owners. The second piece that I really worry about is that if we focus exclusively on a market-driven approach to creating quality, that assumes that over time, the market sorts out the better programs from the poorer programs. Even if you accept that as being true, um, which I'm not sure I do because I have seen parents make misguided choices about early education and I worry that you know the, the focus on the wrong things can sort out the wrong programs. But even beyond that, even if that did work in theory, it would take a few years for the poor programs to close based on parents' lack of interest. And that's a few years worth of young children who've then missed out on a good start to their education. And that's something that we just really can't afford to risk for our kids. And for those, including myself, that aren't really knowledgeable about the voucher system. Could you give us kind of a, a brief overview of what it is and what is being proposed? Well, I can't speak to that in terms of what's being proposed okay. right now, because in early education, there isn't really a proposal on the table yet. Mm -hmm. uh, what, but just the voucher system in general? They vary quite a bit. Um, uh, okay. As I said, in some places, vouchers are are um, really just a, a almost like a replacement for tuition and families can then use them and take them and use them at community centers instead of paying tuition. In other cases, they are tied to what's called a quality rating system or a, uh, what do they call it? Quality rating and improvement system, GRIS. And in those cases, some kind of state entity evaluates the quality of programs and rates them on a five-star basis. And if you have a certain number of stars, then you are eligible for families to use these vouchers. And if you don't have enough stars, then you can't use state funding to go to those centers. And that has improved quality in some places. So uh, it has some benefits, uh, but one of the things that we're learning about these quality rating and improvement systems is that they vary so much from state to state that when researchers have looked at them, they have found that a program that was rated as five stars in one state, if you use the standards from another state, they were rated at one or two stars. I wanted to switch gears just a little bit um, and, and kind of refocus on your work and this book. Again, it's called The Most Important Year, Pre-Kindergarten and the Future of Our Children. What 
what makes a good pre-K? Or what makes a good early childhood education for those of us that are looking even more broadly, according to your research and what you've seen out there? Good pre-K programs teach children how to be learners. They get them excited and curious about learning. They get them in the habit of asking how things work and understanding how things are put together. And they do that in a variety of ways. It's really important that they give kids hands-on, playful, exploratory experiences for learning. So they don't lecture at kids or ask them to regurgitate math facts, but they actually really engage them in doing those things. For example, in counting out the right number of napkins for all the kids in the class, um, or through having a conversation, a rich and interesting conversation about something that happened in a book. And so that's a, that's a key is that these learning experiences should be really hands-on and really fun and playful. In addition, what early childhood classrooms do is build kids' self-regulation skills and teach them how to be part of a classroom. And that's one of the things that kids can get from a pre-K program that they're not going to get at home, no matter how great their families are and no matter how much cognitive stimulation they're getting at home. Because in a classroom, you learn how to be part of a group. You learn how to wait your turn behind 10 other kids. You learn when it's appropriate to share your story and when it's appropriate to hold on to it until the teacher's done reading the book. Hmm. Um, and you also learn to follow expectations and routines. And that becomes really helpful when you get to kindergarten and the later grades because you already know why and how to be part of a classroom community. So those are the two main things, the social skills and the curiosity and the excitement about learning. And when you focus on those things, it's really amazing how much young children can learn in good pre-K programs. They learn a lot more about math and how it works than we ever knew they could. You know, for example, we have learned from research that young kids can learn to do basic arithmetic if you do it in a way that's playful and that means something and, and is actually in the context of their daily lives. Say, say a, a child learns arithmetic, simple arithmetic, right, at three versus five. Does that child actually go on to have a more successful life, adulthood. You know what I'm saying? Like, I always, I always wonder if the push to do things earlier translates to better outcomes, or do we all kind of work towards a mean? And of course, there's some outliers, but that's just genetic. That's a really important question. And the answer is that early education does give kids a head start, but it's not because they learned how to read earlier or they learned how to do addition earlier. It's because it gets them in the habit of learning, mm. of being curious, of understanding how things work, and of helping gently push them along at whatever place they're at. And it's really important for parents and educators to remember that young children learn skills at very different rates, much more so than when they're older. So if you think about baby transitioning into a toddler. Around a year old, kids learn how to walk and talk. Some kids learn how to walk first. Some kids learn how to talk first because they're just simply wired differently to work on one set of skills or another. And that's also the case with cognitive skills and gross motor skills. So when kids are in pre-K, some kids are really working on fine motor skills like how to use a pencil and how to cut with scissors. And some kids are really working on understanding letters and how they work and how you put them together to form words. And what's important is that we meet them where they're at mm -hmm. and we challenge them in a positive way to continue to develop the skills that they're working on and to introduce the skills they're not yet working on. But it's really misguided if we try to get all preschoolers to have the exact same set of reading or math skills at the end of the year. Because the truth is that by the time you get to first grade or second grade, it really doesn't matter whether you read when you were four or when you started to read fluently when you were six and a half. These things, because they're garnering so much attention, they also get muddied. And yeah, you know, new parents or busy parents have enough on their plate to worry about um, every little thing they might do to screw things up. And if their kid isn't progressing, I mean, I know even I obsess over these growth charts. I'm like, yeah, he's tall, but is he too skinny or, you know, and 
and man, you throw IQ or knowledge into the mix and I might just become a basket case. So maybe it's just me talking. Oh, here. totally. <laughs> I, I remember when my, when my eldest child was a toddler, we were at the children's museum and they asked if we could enroll him in a study at MIT to learn how kids develop over the first couple of years of life. And we followed up with them every six months or so. And they would come to the house and they would do these little tests with us. And I remember when he was maybe three and a half, three, three and a half, they did this delay of gratification mm. task with him where they had this kind of like fun toy where the ball went down the ramp to ring a bell. And they wanted to see if he could wait until they told him that it was time to do that. And this was right around the time that Walter Rochelle, Walter Michelle wrote his book, The Marshmallow Test. Yeah, there the was Marshmallow all this Test. <laughs> talk, yeah, there was all this talk about The Marshmallow Test. And I'm sitting there, you know, with my son on my lap who just completely failed the delay of gratification. <laughs> and I was like, I was, I was terrified. I was like, oh no, he's doomed. You know, he's going to be a mess in the classroom. And fast forward, you know, he's now seven and a half and he's an incredibly well-regulated kid. So it was a reminder to me that this is all about patterns over time and encouraging these skills in kids and figuring out like where they're going to need a little more support and supporting them. But there's really no one single experience that is going to make or break your child. Thank you. All, all I can hear all of the anxious parents with a collective sigh of relief. <laughs> and by the way, I would still fail the marshmallow test. So it's OK. You can still make it. <laughs> um, one thing I do want to ask is, you know, take us through when you were identifying good pre-K programs for your children. Right. Making it very personal. What were some specific things you did or looked for to actually decide where to take them? Because you know, we might not always know what to ask for, what to look for, or how to prod or question gently and correctly enough to make those decisions. So if you could help us out, how did you do it? I always look immediately at the teachers and how they interact with children. So you know you found a good program when the teacher gets down on a child's level and welcomes her into the classroom. And you can tell if a teacher really genuinely enjoys young children. So good teachers tend to be very calm and even. They're good at redirecting kids when they're struggling. They don't get frustrated. They don't send them to a corner. Um, so that's really the most important thing is to find a teacher that you feel like is going to be positive and loving and have a good relationship with your child. So that's one thing. And then I also always look around the classroom to see what I see in the physical environment. Because we're learning from research that children benefit from classrooms where there's lots of their work on the walls that sends the message to them that we create a learning process together and your work matters and we hang it up on the walls. So sometimes when you go into a classroom at the beginning of the year, it's actually relatively blank. And that's a good thing. Because we also now have studies that suggest that for young kids, really busy, distracting classrooms with lots of decorations on the walls are distracting and make it hard for them to learn. So if I go into a classroom and there are lots of commercial posters on the walls, like these bright things that teachers ordered from my catalog that say, you know, reading opens new worlds or things like that, um, that's actually a red flag to me that those are things that are not necessarily developmentally appropriate for kids. And I remember one classroom that I went into in DC that just had letters and numbers everywhere and commercially printed calendars and days of the week and vocabulary word lists. And it was just kind of this like sensory assault. And I could see how when you walk into the classroom, you think, oh, wow, this is really enthusiastic and this is really well put together. But what you really want is a classroom where the setting is intentionally designed in a way that teachers are going to use it to help kids learn. So in that particular classroom, on the floor, they had these little circles with numbers and letters on them, kind of interspersed in this way that didn't make a lot of sense to me. And I asked one of the teachers, what do you do with the letters on the floor or the numbers on the floor? And I expected her to say something like, well, when we go outside, we line up on the numbers. But she said, oh, well, we don't do much with those. They're there to expose children 
tell numbers and letters. Mm. And that, you know, again, was a real red flag for me because there is sometimes this idea that we just need to expose kids to as much as possible. But instead, what you really want is to find a classroom where um, the learning is intentional and they're actually using the materials. And then the last thing I would say to look for in a classroom is that kids should be active and engaged and happy and well-regulated at the same time. Definitely not a good sign if you go into a classroom and it's chaotic and kids are running around and they're hitting each other and they're throwing Play-Doh and, you know, obviously there's a problem in that classroom. But it can also be a red flag if kids are totally silent, if they look like they're nervous and scared, they're not willing to talk, um, or they're afraid to touch things in the classroom. Because in a good early childhood classroom, kids are actively engaged. Terrific insight. Man, I first of all, I'm calling my wife as soon as this is over and just saying, you're, you're great. I mean, just the things you were saying, you know, Aww. well, well, just with the, you know, the patience and they get on their level and the redirecting. Oh, my gosh. She always talks about redirecting. And I don't know. It's just it's a skill. It's a real skill. It's a real learned lifelong mission to be a great educator, especially with early childhood. And I think your book and your research and this interview highlights that and um, and pushing for it to become more of a national issue and a service we offer is a valiant you know, mission and something we should work towards. Well, Suzanne, this has been fantastic and, and highly informative. And again, for those that are interested in this, plus just learning more about what we can do as a country or the benefit of early childhood education done well, the book is The Most Important Year, Pre-Kindergarten and the Future of Our Children. Fantastic read. Suzanne, I just wanted to open it up. I know there's um, other places you write. I know you're active on social. For those that want to learn more, of course, we're going to link to the book. But um, do you have any recommendations or places they can find you or other material you recommend? Thanks for asking that. Um, you can find more at my website, which is SuzanneBouffard.com. And I'm also on Twitter at Suzanne Buffard. It's B-O-U-F-F-A-R-D. It's not an easy last name. So I always worry that I say that and then people don't know how to find it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, I, and I try to link to other early childhood resources there because there really is a lot of great information out there. And uh, I'm excited to, to help parents access that. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you so much for your time and thank you for putting this work out there. I hope it makes a difference and we continue to uh, serve those young kids. Thank you so much. It was great to talk with you. Absolutely. You as well. And, and good luck with your uh, good luck with your early education search. For thank your little you. Ones. Yes, we are starting it now. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> but but you've given us some great <laughs> tips. That's the thing. I'm going to I'm going to cut out that portion of the interview, transcribe it and carry it with me and just look at all. Well, these there's, there's also a, there's also a page in my book that has a little checklist of questions that parents can ask when they go into um, classrooms to visit at them. So check that oh out too. Oh my gosh. Okay. Beautiful. B perfect place to end. And again, Suzanne, thank you very much. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Suzanne Buffard. Her book, The Most Important Year, Pre-Kindergarten and the Future of Our Children can be found at your local bookstore and on Amazon. And as always, if you purchase her book or anything else through Amazon, please make sure to use the Smart People Podcast Amazon link located at smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. Any purchase you make through our link comes at no extra cost to you and it greatly helps out the show. If you're looking for other free and easy ways to support the show, head over to iTunes or Apple Podcasts or wherever you download our show and leave a rating and review. If you'd like to reach out to the show, you can shoot us an email at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. All right, that's it for us this week. We've got a lot of exciting episodes coming up. Make sure you head over to the website, smartpeoplepodcast.com, sign up for the newsletter, and we will see you all next episode. <music>